Okay. Y'all remember the movie, The Ants? The movie? It was a cartoon. I'll never forget it. I went and see it. Why'd they want to make an ant cuss in a cartoon? But that was just the beginning, wasn't it? If you're keeping up with what's happening in the world today, ants was nothing. We've got a lot to pray about, a lot to get serious about. If you got your Bibles, I invite you to open up the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't know if y'all, I, well, I, 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 maybe I watch too much news. You know, probably do. But I like to know what's going on. But then again, I have to worry about, well, who am I listening to? Because can, can you trust them? If you were listening to our president a couple of weeks ago, um, he made a comment about what was happening in Sweden the night before. And oh, did he catch it. Y'all remember that? Nothing happened in Sweden last night. There's no news coming out of Sweden. No big deal. That's some more of our presidents just running his mouth when he ought to keep it shut. Did y'all see the, uh, I don't know what his position was, but it was later that week, an individual from Sweden who was one of the politicians was interviewed and he said that they led in to Sweden in the year 2012. I think it was 200,000. I may be wrong. 200,000 of the refugees. And from 2012 to last year, the rape cases on women in Sweden had risen 80%. This last week I was watching in a, a lady, uh, I don't know what her title was or anything, from Sweden. Um, she was something official. And she said that she was thankful that Donald Trump was willing to say something about it because people aren't knowing it or they aren't willing to talk about it. But in Sweden today, in this land, which has been known to be the freest, the most, you know, accepting and you can get along and all that kind of stuff. Everybody come here, you can just, we'll be hunky-dory. Uh, we'll leave you alone, you leave us alone. But she said that in Sweden this week, women don't go out of the house at night. Women don't go anywhere during the day by themselves. Let me share something with you. Maybe you know this. Muslim men have zero respect for women. You don't have the right to drive. You don't have the right to an education according to the Muslim nations and their teachings. And in Sweden now, any woman that's walking around without a man, she's any man's woman. And that's the way they look at it. Preacher, why in the world are you talking about that? The world is telling you, shut up and let's compromise. Be quiet, and let's just get along. I got a tip for you. I ain't planning to get along with a rattlesnake. Y'all ever hell one? I ain't. Well, I did get one one time. It was cropping tobacco. And, uh, we used to take breaks, and Uncle Howard would always go to, to the store and bring us back whatever we wanted. And if we, if we wanted anything other than a Coca-Cola and a pack of crackers, we had to pay for it. Well, I wanted me a moon pie and a thing of milk. And so you, you give Uncle Howard the extra money and he writes it down. He goes to the store and he gets it and he brings Everybody's just in their own little paper bag, you know, paper bag about that big. You know what I'm talking about, a little bit. And uh, he brought us all that wanted something special. And I got my moon pie and my, my bottle of chocolate milk. And, and uh, I, I drank it and ate it. And, and, uh, and I, I was there. We was all out into the back of field now at the end of the rows. And I looked and I saw a baby rattlesnake. I did, I, about that long. 
I laid my paper bag, I opened it up good and wide, and I laid it down on the ground, I picked me up a stick, and I raped that little rattlesnake over and got him into that paper bag. Then I stood the paper bag up, and he was in the bottom of it, and I could see him down there laying in the bottom of it. So I reached down and I twisted the top of the paper bag, and I was holding it in my hand like this, shaking it, because I didn't want to, I wanted it, I wanted it in the bottom, okay? And I kept shaking that paper bag. I come walking back up there to the harvester where everybody was at, and Uncle Howard saw me holding this paper bag with this, uh, uh, me holding it, doing like this, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I got a rattlesnake. And he said, a rattlesnake? You ain't got no rattlesnake in that paper. I said, Uncle Howard, I got a rattlesnake in this paper bag. He said, you don't have a rattlesnake in that paper bag, son. Quit lying to me. I said, Uncle Howard, I got a rattlesnake in this paper bag. He said, give me that bag. I said, Uncle Howard, you don't want this bag. It's got a rattlesnake in it. He said, give me the bag. Here. <laughs> boogity, boogity, I ran. <laughs> I knew what was fixing to happen. <laughs> Uncle Howard had opened that bag, saw what was down in there. He let out a yell and throwed it under a tire of a tractor, and I, he, he caught me about an hour later. <laughs> anyway, rattlesnake. I don't want nothing to do with a rattlesnake. What we got in common? Listen to what God's Word says about you and me and us having something in common with what all of the world out there is doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Let's pray. God, you know where we're living. You know what's going on all around us in this world. You know what we're facing. How, uh, we we want to be friendly, Lord. We want to have friends. But God, so many folks out there who say they want to be our friend, Lord, they're living a lifestyle that is 100% against your teachings and, and they want us to join them. And I pray, God, you'd help us have the courage, the strength, the wisdom to be Christians following you, Lord, doing what you want us to do. For it's in Jesus' sweet name I pray, amen. I trust you realize that the world, ever since the beginning, has been in the process of trying to make Christians uh, compromise what we believe. Even in the garden, when, when the serpent was talking to Eve, oh, did God really say you'll die? Did God really say that? And on and on. Satan was trying to get Eve to compromise, and, and he did succeed in that. Even Moses, whenever he went down to the Pharaoh in, in Egypt, and he went to the Pharaoh, you know, there was actually ten plagues, but four times, four of the times that he went there, the response that the Pharaoh gave to Moses was a compromise. He said, he'd say something like, well, okay, y'all can go, you know, after one or two of the plagues. He said, okay, y'all can go, but just don't go very far. And uh, Moses said, oh, no, we, we, can't, we can't stay right out here by y'all. We're going where God sends us. And another time, okay, okay, after another plague or two, okay, y'all can go, but uh, look, leave uh, your, all your herds and your stock and, and all your sheep and your cows here. And just you, y'all just go. And they said, no, 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 we're going to offer sacrifices to our God. We're not going to compromise on that. And it's like, anyway, four times the Pharaoh tried to compromise with Moses, but Moses said no because God said no. God tells us to do something a certain way. It's supposed to be done that way. Some years ago, I was sitting in a room. A professional counselor was talking, leading the discussion. And this professional counselor began to tell us how that um, we're in a new day now. Things are changing. And we've got to accept it. We can no longer be like you used to be. It's different now. And you've got to. To accept it. I know I run my mouth too much. I oftentimes will later on think and wish I had just kept my mouth shut. But whenever they told us that we had to accept, and in this particular case, they were talking about some alternate lifestyles. I said, I am saved 
washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am called by God to preach His holy word. I do not have to accept sin. That didn't go good. But I'm going to tell you a secret. I meant every word of it. I can, I, hear me well, don't you leave here, don't you stop thinking what I'm saying now. Come on. I know that those who, whatever lifestyle or what, where, ISIS, uh, whatever they are, I can genuinely love them as God says love them. If they're hungry, we can give them something to eat. If they're cold, we can give them something to wear. If they're in all those needs, we can meet their need. I still do not have to accept their lifestyle. Can I get amen? I'm serious. What I just shared with you ain't no joke about what's happening in Sweden and all over Europe. And here some folks want them. I mean, I, look, people, I, I, I got one for you. I watched a good documentary uh, about two weeks ago on Ellis Island, you know, and immigrants coming to America back in, from the late 1800s to the middle 1950s, I believe it was, 53 if I remember. And I could not believe what they had the audacity to say on that program. It was a documentary. They wound up going through all the buildings, showing and all this kind of stuff. And then they, they were being led by this person who was giving them the, the uh, descriptions of everything. And he brought them to a, a table and said, here, they were all asked certain questions. And if the person coming in from whatever country in the world was not physically able to take care of their self, they were sent back where they come from. They were not going to come into America and America start picking up the tab for their health bill. Check it out. It's in the record. That's one of the questions that was put down to all the, and we go, oh, America's always accepted the immigrants. America's always accepted the downtrodden and all this kind of stuff. If they came here, I challenge you, I dare you, Google it or whatever you want to do. Go look at what those people who came in through Ellis Island were asked. Their health, if they had a sickness or disease uh, that uh, was bad, they were not allowed to come into America. Go back to the country you came from. We're not your doctor. We're not here to take care of you. But no, today, today, oh no, no, you know, our, we're supposed to just help everybody, love everybody, care about it. There's so many needy. I agree, there is so many needy. But I'm going to tell you a secret. I like what I hear some of them say about some of our retired servicemen that need a lot of help. And we send the millions of dollars overseas somewhere. Kind of got an opinion on that one too. If you want to hear it sometime, stop me. <laughs> Be glad to give it. Do you understand that the world is trying to get us to compromise everywhere we turn? It's like that. <sighs> you, <clears throat> I can accept diversity. I can accept diversity. I didn't say I can accept all diversity, you know, all these things. That's... But you know what? Is there anybody in here that would dare to be honest and say you, you, you want to be different? Do you know that's why that uh, back some years ago, folks uh, started doing their hair in all these different ways? I mean, I, I'm, looking, I'm trying to be careful what I'm fixing to do. Y'all seen these folks with the hair that comes to here and go straight like this? <laughs> uh, I mean, I get a kick out of laughing at them, you know. But, but wait a minute. They, if you talk to them or you hear them get questioned, about, they just don't want to be like everybody else. They want to be different. Well, then be different. Hey, I got a tip for you. You really be different if you be a Christian. You stand up as a born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb of God, headed to glory one day to walk on streets of gold. You stand up like that as a Christian, and the world will know you're different. We'll really be different. Yeah. Compromise. That's what the world wants us to do. Just take it easy. Don't get all caught up in all this stuff. That's from the ants to the wherever. That's what the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now wait a minute. So the world wants us to compromise. But if you read the scriptures I just read, God said you be careful. You're different. Did y'all see that? Did you see how, how pointed God was in letting us know we are not like the world? I, you know. If y'all listen to me preach very long, you know one of the most exciting truths of the whole Bible is the fact that God's Holy Spirit, and it even refers to it uh, down there in verse 16 that I read a while ago, God's Holy Spirit is right here. He's right here. 
you are looking at, according to the Word of God, the temple of the Lord. Woo! Glory! I know you don't believe it, some of you. <laughs> you, you don't look very templish to me. Yeah. You don't look very saintly to me. I don't care. I'm, I know I am, though, because I got saved. Well, now, as a saved Christian, with God's Holy Spirit living in me, God gives us some instructions here for comparison. Look at verse 14 that we read. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I've heard folks talk about this from many different angles. Um, there used to be folks who would take uh, scriptures and, and, and talk about crossing racial lines. This has nothing to do with race. Zero. Absolutely. I, don't, I, mean, I, I know that, that, that some people won't like it when I say that. It has nothing, absolutely nothing from God Almighty to deal with the race. Let me be honest with you. I still remember when Susan and I first got married. We were part of a young adult Sunday school class at Second Baptist Church. And, uh, and I remember one Sunday morning after church got over, and then we'd taken all the kids home on the buses and the 10 buses we ran every Sunday, and we'd gotten back to the church, and we were kind of gathered around fixing to go someplace and eat some lunch about 1, 1 30. And I looked in there, and I'm just being honest with you, across the back parking lot of Second Baptist Church was walking a, a, a black man with a white woman. And, um, and, and, and I'm talking about we're, we're looking at uh, 1976 or 5 or somewhere along in there. And, of course, that, in that day, whoa, 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 whoa red, red flag. And I can still remember the next Sunday morning in Sunday school class, uh, there was a discussion about what we saw out there and realized they live right next door to the church. And, and uh, they all looked at me for some reason. I was probably the youngest one in the room except for my wife. And uh, they said, Daryl. We want you to study this thing out. You go check it out. You, you make sure what verses of Scripture we need to use so that we can teach our children the truth about God's teaching us about separation. And that's what this is all about, separation right here, even these verses. And I said, I get it. I just, I'm full of confidence. I get it. That next week, I, I got it. I got it slapped in my face. I looked and looked and studied and studied, and I couldn't find nothing. I finally went to my pastor, and I sat down in his office. Brother Saul, this was about Friday afternoon because I found nothing. I said, Brother Sauls, I need some help. <clears throat> he said, what you need? And I told him what had happened. I said, we're just wanting to teach our children when they start growing up the truth about why God teaches separation of the races. And he looked at me and said, ain't in there. I said, Brother Sauls, that's not what I want to hear. Show me what I can teach my children. He says, it's not in there. And he was right. The only scriptures that you'll find in the Bible that deal with the subject of interracial marriage is when Moses married a black woman. And his Moses' brother Aaron got mad and, and uh, his sister. And, oh! You know what God did? He slapped Moses' brother and sister with leprosy. Moses had to pray for them that they'd be all right. I know, hey, I know where we're at, and I know how we feel about it. But I'm going to tell you right now, the way we feel ain't got nothing to do with what God says. And what God says is the final end. That's the law. That's it. So now, we're looking at this separation. It said, be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Nah, let me tell you another direction that goes. Business. Secular business. You know how many times folks make mistakes by getting involved with people who have no moral convictions, no Christian convictions, and they get involved in a business with them? And then later on, this person finds out they're willing to lie, cheat, and steal. You know, well, Uncle Sam don't know how much we did on that. And then on and on it goes, and they wind up getting in trouble because they're not running their business according to Christian principles and teachings. Unequally yoked. So that, that can affect a marriage. It can affect a business. But it goes on and says, And what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, we won't try to go into detail and show any examples of what somebody who is righteous or somebody who is unrighteous, but what they got, to, they're, they're opposites. <coughs> they don't work together. Look at the rest of it, it said, And what communion hath light with darkness? Zero. Y'all do understand that, right? Anytime light comes on the scene, darkness absolutely must Leave. Light and darkness do not, cannot, will not be together. They will not associate. And light always wins, always chases darkness off. 
So, so we've we got to see here now what, what God is trying to get across to us. If you're a Christian, do you know we're the light of the world? Uh-huh. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't y'all wish I could sing? And anyway, you know, I'm a light in the world. And light and darkness, and that is what is ever sinful out there, has absolutely nothing to do with each other, and light always chases off the darkness. We're stronger. We're more able to handle the situation. He goes into verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's talking about the devil. What does Christ and the devil have in common? Think about it. Can you think of anything? I can think of one thing. They're both going to be around for eternity. But that's it. Because one's going to be hot and one's going to be cool. But I only con that's the only they got together. And look, look at verse 15, he goes on and says, What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? In other words, an unbeliever. A person who believes in the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And we declare our belief in the Bible and it's Genesis to Revelation. How can we get along with somebody who doesn't believe any of it? That's what God is trying to show us. <coughs> in verse 16, he says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. We're different. Are you different? You know what most of us will say? Truth, let's be honest. Well, I try, but, you know, I, I mess up a little here and there. I gave it a good shot, though. You know, I think God, God give me an A for effort. I might get an E for effort. Whatever. So now, what I want you to see is this. The world wants us to compromise. But God has told us pointedly that we are not to compromise. We are to stand tall and be different because we are different. If you are just like everybody, please hear this one now. If you are just like everybody else in the world, you're going to hell. If you're going to heaven, it's because God has saved you and indwelt you with the Holy Spirit and you are not like everybody else in the world. Got that? That's what this is about. I've been seeing this stuff lately. To right and left is, is, is sickening to me to see the ways that we are being confronted to people trying to get us to compromise our Christian beliefs, our Christian convictions. They want us to water it down, slow it down, take it easy. You know, don't make, we, they don't want us to make them feel bad. Yeah. Well, now I've got to tell you some truth. God has called us to be separate. He's called us to come out from among the sinful of the world and we're to be that light in the world. But please hear this. He has commanded us to go into the world. Got that? We are commanded to go out there. Matter of fact, when he started off with the disciples that come, follow me, I'll make you to become fishers of men. He was going to send them out there where they were, uh, all these wicked people were living. Jesus himself ate with sinners. And I know if you read the verses and you check it all out and you try to follow this thing in your, in your own uh, study, you're going to find a verse of Scripture where it says that those that do not live like they should live just don't even associate with them. But Jesus did. Now, here's the catch. You see, they need Jesus. And you and I may be the only Jesus they ever see. Jesus himself went into their houses and sat down and ate with them. And the religious leaders of his day fussed, griped, and complained. We, we are not to turn our noses up or be snobby or mean or ugly toward anybody. Not even those with different lifestyles. Hear me well, we are not. It is against the teachings of our God for us to act snobbish and uh, like we're better than they are. We are sinners saved by grace. Amen? You're a sinner, friend. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. I don't care what you've done or haven't done. You are, and you deserve to have went to hell a long time ago. But by the grace of God, the mercy of God, He's willing to forgive us and save us. Now, we are commanded to take that good news. Acts 1.8, you know, you're going to receive power. When you do, you know, go tell the world. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, but you shall receive this power, and, and you will be my witness. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And you will be my witnesses in the world. We're to go out there. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. 
two by two. Where to? Into the world. And he even gave them some instructions. He said, now, you're going to run into some folks that don't like you. You're going to go to some place. They're going to tell you they don't like you. What did Jesus tell them to do? Come on. Jesus said, you go to that house where they will not receive you and won't accept you and don't want nothing to do with you, then pick up your foot, brush the dust off the soles of your shoe and go to someplace else where somebody will listen to you. So he's already, he knows there's folks out there that don't want anything to do with Christians. And he lets us know that. But he says, go anyway. Keep on going. So we're, we're commanded, we're commanded to go out there into the world, even though we're supposed to be separated from the world. Our morals... Our habits, our lifestyle, our conversation. We are not like the world. And if in those areas you're just like the world, you got a problem. You got a problem. Now, I got one for you. How do we get separated from the sin? If it's all around us, I still remember. When I got saved at age 21, I stopped drinking my beer and smoking my cigars, using bad language. I did. But I remember about three weeks after I'd gotten saved. And I, I, hadn't, I hadn't used an ugly word, hadn't smoked a cigar, hadn't drunk a beer. And about three weeks later, I was assigned one week to a particular job. And there's this guy named George. He was older than I was, and he would have been my supervisor, if you want to say it properly, on that assignment. And we were supposed to be going up and down the highways of middle Georgia doing a survey. And I'll never forget, he had me driving because he was the one in charge. He could sit over there with a notepad in his lap, and I could, he could make me turn here, turn there, whatever. And I remember we were just talking, but George was, he cussed bad. We were driving down the road, and I could still remember Highway 96 where you crossed the river bridge. And George had been, yin, 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 just being George. Yin, 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 yin. And, and about every third word was an ugly word. Ugly word. And I was just sitting there listening. And I was just driving. And I looked at him, and I said, George, did you know? And I, and I said something. And in the middle of that sentence in my response to George, I stuck that same stinking, dirty, ugly word that he'd been using. Now, when I said it, literally, I said, I slapped the pulpit, not pulpit, I didn't have pulpit then. Of course, he might have thought it was. I slapped the steering wheel. I slapped it hard. Thought I was going to break the thing. George reared back, listen, what's the matter with you? I said, George, I got saved about three weeks ago. I'm a Christian now. I'm trying to live like a Christian. I haven't cussed one time the whole time we've been together, and you've been sitting there running your mouth with that dirty, stinking word, and look at me. I just said the same thing. I don't like it. George kind of straightened up a little bit. I never forget this. He said, that's good. Good you get saved. I'm the youth leader of my church. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I am not kidding you. The people who claim to be Christian but are living like the devil himself and they're going to bust hell wide open. And how many are going to carry with them? That's what gets me. How many are they going to carry with them? Oh. But you and I are told to come apart. How do we do it? We do it like God's Word says. Do it. Romans chapter 12. And y'all, I, I quote these verses all the time because I love them. They're very meaningful to me. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. Now, see, that's another separation. Be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world make you like they are. We ought to be setting the example so they will want to be like us. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? Come on. Hallelujah. By the renewing of your mind. Thinking. Thinking. Apostle Peter. You remember he got in trouble one night? You remember that? Early in the morning. You know why he got in trouble? He was in the wrong place. 
he was gathered together with that bunch of uh, heathens that were going to kill Jesus. He, he, wanted, he wanted to follow Jesus, but he didn't want to get too close because if you got real close, you might get a sword in the back. So he was outside, gathered around the fire, staying warm. It's spring of the year, early. It might have been a frost that night. He was out there cold, and they're staying warm by the fire. And all those heathens those were gathered around that fire, and along comes that little girl, maid, and she sees Peter. And she says, you were with Jesus. I saw you. You were with Jesus. No, oh, you got it wrong. And uh, he denies it. She walks off. Yes, yes, you were. Your, your voice is giving you away. Your accent, the way you talk, you talk just like Jesus talked from where he came from. You were with, and y'all know what wound up happening on the third time. Peter was in the wrong place. He was with the wrong folk. And Peter himself wound up cussing and saying, I don't know this Jesus. I don't know who you're talking about. And y'all remember what happened then? Peter turned and looked toward the windows and doors where Jesus was inside. And through one of those openings, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Their eyes met. And all of a sudden, Peter knew. He was denying that he even knows him. And he ran off out into the night and wept bitterly all night long. Wrong place, wrong crowd. Association. You see, we're called to be separate. I've been in places and I've been around folks who they didn't care if I was a preacher. Matter of fact, they were glad when I walked up because they wanted to make sure I knew they weren't scared of me. And they'd cuss a little more, a little louder. So the preacher, no, they weren't afraid of no preacher. Yeah, I'm going to bust hell wide open. I'm sorry. How do we be separated from the world, but yet being a witness in the world? Take God's word and hide it in your heart. Yeah, you got to study. Yes, it will cost you time. Yes, it is a command from God. All the way back from Deuteronomy chapter 6, all the way through the New Testament, we're commanded to study. Yeah. But do it. So when you're tempted, when that whatever it is, jumps up in front of you and makes you greedy or lustful or, or whatever, angry, that all of a sudden you can have inside of your brain, your mind, the teachings of God. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Oh, boy, I had to memorize that one a long time ago. <laughs> and I needed it pretty regular. You know what? I still needed it pretty regular. Whenever somebody does me wrong, y'all get done wrong. Well, every now and then people do preach you wrong. And whenever they do, you know, I have to say, how do I handle this? First thing I got to do is I got to realize God wants me to be kind to them. God wants me to be concerned about them, loving, whatever. I care. And I've got to do this because God the Father didn't want to save me to start with. Only because of Jesus that God was willing to forgive me. Yeah. Yeah. Can I give you a bottom line reason why you and I should want to be separated from the world, be like Jesus, but be a witness to the world? God said it through Ezekiel. He called him and said, you my man. You sit on that wall and you watch for the enemy. You see the enemy coming. You warn the folks in town. Tell them, look out, look out, look out. But if you sit on that wall 
and you see the enemy coming and you don't warn the people in town, when they die because they weren't aware of the trouble that was coming, I'm going to require their blood on your hands. Folks, you say, I, I, I don't doubt. The, probably 99% of us in here have made a profession of faith. Maybe more than that, percentage-wise. But do you understand we've been saved for a reason? To be separate from the world, but yet a witness to the world. That story in Ezekiel grabs me, and I can never forget it. 1974, a guy named Joe. I had the privilege to be in on a, a Monday night session when he got saved. And on Wednesday night, he started talking to me about his buddy. Joe was a Marine. Pretty tough little fellow. And Joe was home for his 30-day or 60-day, whatever it was, leave before he was going to go overseas. He'd just come through boot camp, Paris Island. And Joe was fired up by Jesus. After that Monday night get-together, he got excited about Jesus. Can you believe that? He actually went to the Houston County Mall and walked up and down the inside the mall giving away gospel tracts to everybody. I think they ran him out. <laughs> He's passing out the gospel. He came to me, and he had, uh, he had brought some of his friends, three or four of his buddies had been willing to come to church with him during this two months. And I'll never forget Mike. Mike had hair that come down to his waist, which that's not such a bad thing. We just need to clean it more. <laughs> but Mike, the thing that got me is every time I ever saw Mike you get in front of him and look at him and talk to him. His eyes is doing that number. And I am not kidding you. I think he was smoking something or drinking or whatever every time I ever saw him. But Joe liked Mike. Joe brought Mike to church. Joe came to my house the night before he was headed for the Philippines. He said, Daryl, I remember, I remember saying, Mom and Daddy's driveway. Daryl, you know I'm leaving tomorrow. I said, yeah, I know, Joe. You behave. Daryl, you know Mike now, right? I said, yeah, I know Mike. Mike needs Jesus. I think he's listening. Would you go talk to him? Yes, Joe, I would. Tuesday night visitation. I went to church. and <laughs> I'm not kidding, y'all. About a dozen men. They were getting cards with names and addresses. I said, I don't need a card. I know where I'm going. I'm going to see Mike. I said, Mike? I said, which Mike? And I told them, you know, none of them would go with me. <laughs> I ain't kidding you. Not one of them was willing to go with me. I knew where I was going. Pretty rough neighborhood. Well, I went anyway. I got lost. And I am not kidding. It was a mobile home park. Probably had a thousand mobile homes in it and you know when it was like there's little roads going everywhere and I, I i got to my witness i got lost i kept looking i tried but i couldn't find it. i said man I, I i can't find the house they told me to look for so i finally went back but i made up my mind i'm gonna i'm gonna get the address i'm gonna get it straight i know somebody who can tell me and the next week i did i got it straight i got the address i knew right exactly where that mobile home was and so the following tuesday night once again didn't find anybody willing to go with me but i went and I, I never forget this, driving around through that mobile home park there in North Warner Robins and, and mobile homes for miles. And I found the one I needed to get to. And as I rounded the little corner in this driveway, I looked up and there was the mobile home I was going to. And I am not kidding you folks. God is my witness. Every window was open and the doors were all open. And there was smoke rolling out of every window. It weren't on fire. But this, I mean, you could, it was just smoking. It was all smoking the pot. And I, I slowed down right in front, and I looked over there at that trailer, and I realized there were people standing outside, inside, everywhere. And they, man, it, it, I figured if I got out, I'd get high. But really what I thought was, I ain't going in there. 
Law's gonna raid this place for sure, and they get they'll get Daryl Quinn. My name will be in the paper, you know. So I I, I left, and I put it off the next week. I decided, well, you know, I I won't. I don't know how news travels as fast as it does, but it wasn't but about four weeks after Joe left for the Philippines that I got a personal letter from him. I remember getting home from work and a. Mama told me, said, here's a letter for you from that, that boy Joe. I looked, I said, oh. I went back to my bedroom. And I opened up that letter and I started reading. Joe said he was in the Philippines. He had found some Christians in the group he was in, and they had actually gone to some mall in the Philippines passing out tracks. I said, amen. I got down to about the third paragraph. I guess you heard. Mike. Brown. Sat down on the bed. I picked it up. I read it again. Joe, all the way around the other side of the world, had already heard about it. Mike was swimming up at Lake Sinclair. Fell out in the boat and got hit by another boat and drowned. I never witnessed to him. Said I would. You know, the Bible does say that there will be tears in heaven. Don't get it wrong. It says he will wipe them away. That means they're there for him to wipe them away. Have you ever studied that teaching about the goats and the sheep? Sheep are on one side, the goats are on the other. And Jesus looks at the sheep, says, Enter in, ye good and faithful. And looks on the other side of the goats, says, Depart from me. I don't know you. My imagination sometimes is too, too. It's like I've seen myself standing over there with the sheep. And Joe in line with the goats. He goes to hell because nobody told him. And I'm one of them that should have told him. We are commanded to go out into the world to be a witness that's not an option for you, friend. You saved, you got a job to do. We're commanded to go. But as we go, we're to be different. Jesus goes with us. You saved, he's in you. You're not alone. You're not alone. Come apart. From the world with your manners, your hobbies, your conversation, your lifestyle. Come apart from the world, but make sure the world knows you believe in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us when we're not worthy. Thank you for being willing to forgive us for our sins. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. Thank you for the chance to try to be one of your children serving you. Lord, may we serve you. May we be victorious Christians in the midst of a wicked world. Please, Lord. For your glory, then we know it'll be for our good. In Christ's name I pray.